You're watching the show. Is everybody watching our show tonight? Don't say if you're not. Oh, good. I'm glad. All right, that's good. Because so are you, and I'm glad of that. Because I eat at your I eat at your restaurants more than you see my shows, but that's also I don't have as many shows as you have restaurants. Exactly. So. <laughs> And consistency is what we're kind of specializing in. So yeah. we like some of the things that we do and come yeah. back for them. Well, that's them. the thing. When you were saying about doing, making the same thing every day, or you know, hundreds and thousands of times, that's what happens with uh, performing. And I hate to use the word live performing, but it's live performing. The audience, the musicians, and the dancers are alive. And you do the same thing every night. It's not like this horrible lockstep North Korean rigidity that you have to participate in, it is the, the idea of recreating something anew every day over and over again. And it takes an enormous amount of discipline and you get over, you know, there's an occasional boredom and there are problems and that's what you do. That's well, the you devotion of that. Like you watch a performance. Yeah, and say, all right, everything went great for four weeks, and the New York Times loved you, and all of a sudden all the national stuff's picking up. And then you walk in one night, and for some reason you're not happy with it. What do you do? Do you yell at people? I yell at people all the time until they start performing. And once we're performing, I leave them alone. So they're very happy when we have a long season, because I've done all of my blaspheming in the weeks leading no, up to it. No, but I'd say the end of what you would might consider a, a less than ideal performance, would you have a little meeting? end of the show? I would say that's, that was a little bit under. That's my euphemism. Okay. It's a little bit under. With a singer, that means they're flat. Right. And with a dancer, it means it, they seem distracted they in some way. Juice. It may not slow or fast, like uh, conductors always think it's just about slow and fast, but it's really about this sort of energy and this sort of tone that one maintains through a performance. And it's not, you know, it seems like it's not that big a deal. The, the principle job of the people in my company is that they perform an hour and a half or two hours every few days and it seems like a nothing job except every other minute around it is leading up to that the the warming up and the rehearsing and the thinking and the fretting and the mascara and all of this it turns into the you know the result is this show that can't be repeated and is a one-off thing it goes away and that's what we do over and over. It's a weird thing to do the n same new thing over and over and over and over. Well, how long would you perform for, say, the, this new group of pieces that debuted this week? Is that a month or is that a year? We do these pieces in different combinations, in different places, wherever we go on tour. Mm -hmm. It depends on musical forces, what we've done somewhere else. We tour more than we perform in one spot. This is, what is this, a four-show season here at BAM? four performances, whew, that's not a lot, and we kill ourselves putting this together. Then we'll do you know, these pieces in different arrangements with other dances. We usually keep about 15 or 20 pieces in active repertory dances that are seven, to, seven minutes to two hours long, all sort of uh, in, in active you know, repertory all the time. So let me yeah. ask you this. Like I write a recipe and I send it to someone and they cook it and I go over there and I taste it and that's it. They either did it right or they didn't do it right, and I can help them. Mm -hmm. If you were to send a brand new piece that no one had seen to another performance group, and then they played it after practicing it, yeah. would you recognize it? Yes. If they, blindly. If so I right, here's a piece. Yeah. Well, no, but here's a piece. It's Tell hard. Tell me what this is. Right. Could you say, oh, yeah, I remember I did that in 1984. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can Definitely. recognize it that, obviously. I remember. But, I mean, done by people that you've never met. That's my question. Oh, God. How interpretive can that act become that you might not even know what it was? Oh, my God. Well, first of all, I'm very, very careful who gets to do my work. The work that my company, the Mark Morris Dance Group, does is done by my company and by universities. I use it as, like, a teaching aid. But I choreograph for classical ballet companies, and those, because of the style, the international style of ballet, for good or ill, those people are capable of doing the same pieces better. And of course, there are regional dialects, and I like it better, or uh, I like it more or less, depending on how it's done. But really, it's a strange kind of thing, where if I, if I see a dance of mine done by a company, and it doesn't work, I'll rehearse it, A, or B, I'll withdraw it if I don't want it to be 
Part of my well, right, exactly. Brain. Oh, that Mark Morris stuff right. really sucks. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If yeah. I'm thinking that, right. there's a problem. Right. You know, if I fall asleep during one of my own pieces, that's not so good. Well, as opposed to falling asleep, should you just get up and leave? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we had this discussion the other night. Like, what if you're at a dance thing and you're Mark Morris? Kind of like I'm Thomas Keller, for example. And I'm sitting at a table, and all of a sudden they bring us something. And at a certain point, you're just like, I, I, I'm tired. I want to go away. Can you do that? Can you do that as a guest at someone else's performance? At a Merce Cunningham dance? Can you just get up and leave? Uh, I can. Yes. Do you? No. <laughs> I, I very, uh, you know, I'm so super famous for something that happened about 38 years ago. Um, where when I, you were four? Yes. yes. When I booed a show, which I hated. I booed it and then left instead of just leaving and booing at home. But... I, it was important to me, so I did it. And I would still do it, except now my celebrity or notoriety means that the people in, in the show know that I'm there, and I don't want to hurt their feelings because they're doing their darndest. So if the show is crap and I have to leave, it's, it's rough. I feel a little bit bad. So consequently, I do the terrible, cowardly thing of not going to something because I think it's going to be bad, so I don't go. Don't do that, everybody. Go anyway, please. But, you know, if every time you walk out, uh, you know, every time you slip out of something, it becomes storming out in the paper the next day. Right. And I just don't like that. So. And now that just like in the restaurant business, there's dance blogs. Every, yeah. Every silly person that ever walked in and recognizes you was going to be the person that was, I was sitting next to Mark Morris when he stormed out. Yeah, exactly. Fit. Absolutely. Right. Happens all the time. I left a show once. This is terrible. The wonderful, who I love, uh, the late Pina Bausch, did a performance here that started years ago. It started really, really late. I was really tired. It was really, really long, like all of her work. And it was pretty good. But I got kind of bored, and I thought, let me just leave. This is in Bam, next door at the Opera House, the Howard Gilman Opera House. And so I'm on the aisle because I have to have an aisle. And I stood up, and I'm skulking out. At the, it's like, I just, I can't take it. It was fine, but I just got to go. And I skulk out the aisle, up the middle aisle, and I stand up, and it's Pina standing right there, who I know. It's like, you know, like, I, I must have to go to the bathroom or something. I don't even know. And I left. I'm in the lobby, ready to go. One second later, applause. The show was over. I left ten seconds before the end of a four-hour show. And Pina, I imagine, was crestfallen. I hope she was crestfallen. I was a, anyway. Maybe she thought, oh, I'm going to take that seat. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Anyhow. Should we do questions? Take sure. questions, questions or something? Do you have another big question for me, Mario Dolling? Well, I don't have one for you. I always have a big question in that. In the next ten years, do you want to keep doing what you're doing, or do you want to stop doing what you're doing? I want to keep doing what I'm doing. How about you? Well, as I say often to my family, I never feel like I'm going to work. So yes, I'm probably going to keep doing this as long as they'll have me. But in that same sense, I'm also the kind of person that when I'm at work, I don't look at my watch and say, oh good, in an hour I can go home. Right. It's more like, I should have gone home two hours ago. Yeah, exactly. Which is, you know, happens enough, and I have a tolerant and beautiful wife and friendly family, so they can understand what I'm just doing what I really love and really enjoying it and doing really good at it, I hope. I like to think that I'm smart enough that if I realize that I'm miserable and detest what I'm doing and can't see any light at the end of any tunnel, that I'm smart enough to just walk away. But I don't know. I think I also have this addiction to this kind of job and life. So we'll see. There you have it. We're here forever. <laughs> Try the veal. Get comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Some questions, hey? You. Me? Yes, you. I would like to ask you about the history of your own dancing. You know, as a child, did you begin to dance? Did you take lessons? When did it move from dancing to also doing choreography? Hard as it is to believe, I rarely danced when I was a child. <laughs> sorry. I couldn't blow that one off. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm not going to give you my bio. I just refuse. No, I'm not asking for your bio. I just want to know when you began to dance and what kind of dance you did. Sounds like a bio to me. Um, I started dancing. My mother, my darling, darling mother, um, took me to see a performance of 
Jose Greco and Nana Lorca, pre presented by I uh, probably Saul Hurok in Seattle. The great shows came to Seattle, and I went to see this flamenco company, Spanish dance company, not specifically flamenco. And I said I would like to learn how to do that kind of dancing. And my mother found me a teacher in Seattle when I was eight or nine, and I studied flamenco before I learned any other kind of dancing. Also, in the program at the show tonight, you'll see there's a biography in the program. There's also a very good biography, although it's a little long in the tooth now, a very good biography of me called Mark Morris by Joan Akuchel, and it's really good. That's all. It tells way more than I even know about myself. But that's how it started. Then I added ballet and I added a lot of folk dancing, contemporary dance, modern dance, whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, I started, I, I made it up myself before I really knew that anybody else did it. So I was making up dances, thank God, un, uh, unimpaired by education. Thank did God. you go to college? Did you go to school? I went to Rutgers, the State University you of did? New Jersey, yes, and okay. I loved it. Good. I mean, I studied Spanish theater of the golden age, not a real career builder, but I was very good at it. And I wasn't an actor, I was a reader and understander of it. But I loved going to college, and I really appreciated the time I spent there. That's great. All I have is... anything to do with my career. I have a handful, a big handful of honorary doctorates from every university on earth, and I never, ever went to college. I, I didn't even know where it was. Maybe because I actually have an undergraduate degree, they have been very chintzy in handing those to me. <laughs> I keep waiting for like Johnson and Wales or one of these cooking schools to invite me over and not an invitation comes. Oh, sorry. I don't even sorry. have an answer. No, there is no answer. <laughs> I just have to get, I have to work longer. Ms. Vitali, the book he, the guy, I think the book what? No, I think the book's name. I'm joking. I know it is. The guy that followed you, worked with you for a year, he describes a dinner that you both had and you, that you put away a whole case of wine. Is that true? We didn't put it away, my friend. We drank it. <laughs> <laughs> Having put it away, we might have got home a little earlier that night. But no, we drank a whole case of wine. You know, if you start cooking at like 2 in the afternoon, you're going to have dinner with guests over at 6. It just kind of happens. If you start with white wine and then end and people come over, I mean... But I mean, you know, that was Bill. Keep in mind, Bill Buford is a macho dude who wrote Amongst the Thugs, which is this weird ex essay of understanding following around these soccer crazies. And, and he had to create a story out of a relatively mild-mannered fellow like myself and the kind of things that I do in the world. And he did, and he created a good book, and about 80% of it is true, and 20% of it is the writer's prerogative to make it more whatever Bill wanted to make it. So, you know, it, it was an interesting book. It, it was embarrassing to have my father-in-law say, because apparently I, they counted how many times I said fuck, and it's like more than 500. And, and my father-in-law, who's a relatively really cool guy, said, so fucking Mario, how the fuck are you today? What the fuck are you doing? I'm like, excuse me, Miles? He said, oh, I read fucking E last night. How's it fucking going? It was just like, at the end of the day, no matter how funny or smart you think you are, you don't sound very smart. At least I don't. And, it was, it, and I liken the experience to standing on stage in a room filled with mirrors with very bright lights for 24 hours naked. It's not exactly what I thought I'd look like. But at the end of the day, it was flattering to be a piece of that. And in 10 years, when I finally get over the scars, uh, I'll be proud that it was written about me. And as, as a document about the kind of fascination with cooking and cooks of our time, it was interesting to be involved in it. I have subsequently learned in a very important phrase around journalists, limited access, <laughs> which I obviously did not know then. Well, you also know that off the record doesn't exist. There's right. no such thing exactly. as that. That means... Pay extra special exactly. attention. Well, then I'm about to say something really stupid. <laughs> you. So I have a, uh, two questions. Um, you just get one. <laughs> and who chose it and why? And then, Mark, before you, uh, you were discussing uh, if some other company does one of your dances, you are always involved in terms of the direction Okay, yeah, the first part. You did the first part. Uh, this is a red wine that was in the closet in, the, uh, in Mark's in my uh, dressing, room. dressing room. He said it's a pretty good Bordeaux that's not bad. And in fact, it is delicious. It's La Rose du Pain, 2005, and it's uh, delicious. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we had good wine the other night, I think. Yes, we I'm did. Pretty sure. Much of it. Um, if a company, if a university does my work, that I send someone who does it, and if I can, I go and look at it and rehearse it. 
if uh, that's even true with, with ballet companies. Uh, there are people most uh, there are people who used to dance with my company who have now uh, graduated <laughs> and uh, set my work on other people. I trust very few people to do that. They set my dances. I will go if I can to help with casting and to do final rehearsals. Music rehearsals are particularly important to me. Um, but uh, sometimes I can't. So it's not like a giant franchise or anything, but uh, I trust the people I work with and that's it. And I see it when I can. If it's, it's, a, if it's a real piece of shit, I'll take it away, but that hasn't happened for a long time. So. Some more at you. You. Are you now? Are you now or have you ever been? Excited by the merging of ballet and modern dance? And in, the, in, the, in the hard nut. Um, yeah. How to do it at the end with David and Lauren. I see or whoever's that, dancing it. Yeah, uh -huh. right. uh, I see uh, one that's more ballet and one is more modern. And it, as a union of it, were you thinking of anything like that? Well, you know, a union of ballet and modern dance, to me that's a little bit like uh, President Barack Obama deciding to be bl a black president, and he could e just as easily have decided to be a white president, unless, of course, I'm from the South. But, you know, it's like, well, I'm not sure anymore, I'm not interested in this schism, I'm not interested in, I'm, I'm not at all interested in what comes from where. Because, as I learned on my first trip to Europe when I was 17, and I was still kind of vaguely imagining it when you flew over Europe that there would be lines and there would be different pastel colored countries <laughs> and that he spoke German up to this line and then it was French and of course that's absolutely untrue the amazing variety and you know fluidity of, of language and culture and art there's no deciding what if this is you know, new wave, or this is, you know, um, post, uh, I don't know, post coital, I don't know, whatever, post <laughs> it, to decide, you know, um, what, what do you, how do you decide, like, what's a, a pointed foot is a ballet quotation? It's not. A spin is a postmodern thing. I don't know. I, I think, I, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I might a little bit in saying that I find that stuff just so, uh, didactic and so sort of bullshitty that it's like it's not it's of no interest to me I make up dances and of course I work in the, in the classical ballet industry I work in the contemporary dance world I work in in this very fragile arts community that someone decided that artists had to be super fragile in order for it to be effective I think that's nonsense so of course ballet dancers who are incapable of doing the work that my company does that's one thing. My company, who are fully capable of doing everything that a ballet company does, what does that do? It's not, it's not a better or worse thing. It's not a classical ballet versus modern dance. Then there's this whole international style of contemporary dance where you're doing kind of ballet e stuff, only you're wearing socks so you can slide on the floor. It's like, I don't even know what you should do. And if nobody comes to your shows, does that mean it's modern dance? And if, <laughs> And if everybody goes to your shows but they don't like it, does that mean it's classical ballet? I don't even know anymore. So the answer is yes. <laughs> See, when I said about happy smart, there you go. What's happy drunk about now? That no, it's like, somebody in the back, you so desperate. Do you just have to pee? Is that why you're on this up so hard? Go ahead, you, sir, or madam with the beard. Sir, can you, can you talk about the significant differences and similarities between the stage picture and feel of the one movement of Sakrat in 1983 and Sakrat tonight in 2010? Just a few of the major differences and similarities. No, I think, did you see that? No, you're way too young. I was born in 83, so now I just... Oh, doll. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Congratulate, happy birthday. Uh, Oh, it is? Oh, okay. All right. Wait, I have to tell you something. There was this Spanish dancer in San Francisco Ballet. Gorgeous, wonderful guy from Spain, because all of the good ballet dancers are now from Spain. From Victor Rujate's school. And this very young guy, hardly any English. I'm teaching class. Um, I said, I said, hey, I won't say his name. I said, ¿cuántos años tienes? Right? How old are you? How, old, how many years do you have? How old are you? And he says, 20. And I said, 
when's your birthday? And he said, next year. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> so beautiful. He's a fabulous kid. Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> next year. <laughs> yeah, here. Um, here's what I have to tell you. The Socrates of many, many years ago, 83, you should know, Arlene Croce, the great, great genius dance critic, formerly at the New Yorker magazine, said about that piece, I will remember it, she said as an idea something, it was really good, as a dance, it was inert. <laughs> and I thought, well, wow, let's see, a dance that's inert, isn't that not a dance at all? Isn't that like a photograph or something? I don't know. Anyway, I took it as a beautiful compliment. I have to tell you, that piece, the, I have not watched that since the day it happened. It's in my archives at the Mark Morris International uh, Dance Studies building across the street. I haven't watched that piece. I'm thinking of showing it to my company after having done this. But I have to tell you, one little thing that happened ac accidentally um, is that Martin Pakladinas, who designed the extremely gorgeous costumes for Socrates, somehow managed to, one of the styles is exactly the costume that we wore for that piece, and he never saw it. I haven't seen it, my dancers haven't seen it. It was inert. <laughs> couple of more? You. I want to ask a quick question about memory, about artistic memory. Um, okay, that's a good practice. Go ahead. Mark, you've, you've created, what, 100, 140 different dances in your repertoire. Mario, hundreds of dishes, perhaps. You want to go back and reproduce something you created 20 years ago. You want to go back and uh, you're, you're adding a piece to your, to your performance season that you created 20 years ago. Is it there in your memory? Do you have the recipe written down? Do you have videotapes? How do you recall every move that your dancers made when something was created 20 years ago? How, how, do, you recall, how do you reproduce a dish that you created 20 years ago? Dish? <laughs> To say that your style evolves over time doesn't preclude you from remembering how you made it when you were younger and dumber. That means to say, though, that you may have used less soggy ingredients or things that weren't necessarily right the ones that you might use now to recreate that dish. That said, I wrote everything down, so I have the recipe. But it hasn't changed much in terms of the recipe ideology, and, and the way that it would look wouldn't look much different than a dish that I made completely modernized, not changing the recipe very much but changing a few of the ingredients to be the maximum expression of a scallop or of a peach or knowing not to use them when they're not perfectly in season. So in creating that dish again, I could probably do a pretty good job using the great ingredients and not even come close to what it tasted like in its time because I wasn't necessarily that soggy man. What I can do as a cook <laughs> is I'm real, I've gotten really good at <clears throat> replicating food that I eat on my travels. Like, I'm a very convincing Indonesian cook. And it's, I have no training, I just have a good recollection and imagination. In my dances, uh, the, sh the, the old tiny dance tonight, which is Behemoth, one of the dancers uh, who was in it originally set the piece. There's videotape of it, I never watch it. Um, he set the dance. And when I watch a rehearsal, it's put, I don't put it back together. I'm not good at that. I would just redo it. And then you end up with one, you know, uh, brown, dun-colored dance that's the exact same thing as everything you've ever done. So I don't modify pieces from the past. We reconstruct them from the oral tradition and from videotape and whatever notes there are. And then I come into rehearsal after it's put together and I say, no, it's like this because I remember it exactly, exactly. For those of us who are not in the dance world, what does the expression set the piece mean? Set the piece. Ah, that means set the piece to, to teach it to other people to do it. People who haven't been in it. I mean, I set a dance in the first place. You, you know, that's choreographing a, a dance. You, you make it up. You set it on a company. That's what you say. And then you reset it um, to teach it to people who haven't done it before. So you reconstruct it and make it come true. You, you manifest it. That's what setting is. I'm worried that it's like 7.45 and the show started 15 minutes. 10 o'clock. It's 10? Oh, great. Let's go out to dinner. Show. We have to stop. Right? Is there one more question? Is that it? I think one more question. Green stripes in the back of most of you. Yes. How did you guys meet? How did we meet? 
Truth or fiction? <laughs> Let's go with the fiction first and then the truth. Let's see. We were, um, we, we met in the dark. <laughs> but we met at Bobo, I think. That's what you said. I don't remember. Yes. Ten-ish years ago, me and my best friend, Isaac Mizrahi, were dining. Shay, uh, Mr. Batali, and I think you, I don't know what happened. He came out and accosted you with extra dishes. Yeah, that's it. And we're friendly. We've done some, we've rubbed each other's backs a little bit, and we're good friends. I love what he does, and he sees I love what he does. does. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope you love everything, because we're done. Thank you. Goodbye. Right, Arnold?